The following program is a co-production of Seattle Channel and Seattle City Club and sponsored by Comcast. It's a crisis that cannot be ignored. The planet Earth is going to be okay. It's just humanity that's in problems. So. <laughs> and the state political party chairs focus their priorities. We deserve to have the best person in the Oval Office. We do not have that now. But it's important that we have a dialogue and we can agree to disagree, but still treat each other with respect and dignity. And I think that's very important. It's all coming up on Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter here this evening with Washington Governor Jay Inslee. Journalists helping with the questions this evening are Chris Daniels from King 5 News and Brandy Cruz of Q13 News. And I have to note, both state and city law preclude this from being a campaign-oriented program, but we have plenty of issues to talk about. Hi, Governor. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, what brings you to town? <laughs> You don't have to answer that. Thank you. M moving Thank right you. along, let's, let's, let's go down to Olympia for a Thank moment you. here and uh, talk about there are two climate uh, change bills that, are, that have already passed, uh -huh. uh, one each in, uh -huh. in, in, in different chambers. Can you tell us about those two pieces? Yeah, and actually, uh, th there are more than two moving. Uh, there's been a couple that have passed one chamber. Uh, the ZEV bill, the Zero Emission Vehicle Bill, has passed to uh, essentially encourage the use of clean uh, cars that don't uh, emit pollution. Very excited about that. We're leading the country, by the way. We have the most uh, electric cars on the road now, maybe tied for first or second. We're very excited about that. Our state is actually leading the country. We have the most electric cars that we're buying, so we can drive the demand for electric cars in our state government. So this would enhance and, and, and increase that uh, rate of acceleration. We've had a 100% clean electrical bid uh, bill passed, which is very, very exciting. It has passed uh, the Senate, and this bill will guarantee utility users 100% clean energy. We believe the technologies are there to do that at the appropriate year, and I'm very excited about that. But we have other bills. We have a bill that will... Uh, that will require transportation fuels providers to provide cleaner fuels with less pollution, less carbon pollution. Exciting provision. We know it works. It's working in California. Uh, we are very confident it's going to get a vote in the House here very quickly and then go to the Senate. We have a bill that will increase our access to net zero uh, uh, buildings so they don't use energy like the Bullet Center, uh, which was a supremely beautiful. If you haven't gone to this, it's really cool. Uh, and then we got another bill working on incentives. So the legislature is very active on this, and I, I feel really good about the progress that's going on. Uh, so that one Senate bill, I don't know the exact name of it, but it's the one that phases out carbon emissions mm -hmm. at power plants by 2045. Mm -hmm. um, that's a fine goal, but what's the rigor that's behind it? I, it is a legally binding requirement of the utilities that, are, that is legally enforceable. So when you have the law behind you, that's pretty good. That helps. And we think the technologies are coming on so rapidly. Uh, and, and we've made so much progress in our state. You know, we started when we passed our renewable portfolio standard, you'll recall, on the ballot. Uh, we had zero wind energy, and now we've got a $6 billion industry in the state of Washington because we set a goal, and we're now, in a, we're now more than... Uh, meeting that goal, and it's creating all kinds of jobs. And that's the thing that's very exciting to me, because uh, this isn't just about getting clean air and this, the small matter of preserving life as we know it. <laughs> By the way, you know, when people say, oh, the planet's in dire trouble, well, that's not really true. The planet Earth is going to be OK. It's just humanity that's in problems. So <laughs> that's what we're concerned about. Uh, but. But we think this bill has a capacity to build, to create more jobs in a whole host, including batteries. You know, when you, when you have renewable energy, you need to balance its load because renewable energy, wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine. So you need to integrate your grid to make sure you have consistent uh, electricity. And you can do that in a variety of ways, which is to have multiple systems available to you or have batteries. And we're actually... Uh, manufacturing. There's a company in Muckleteal that manufactures the largest vanadium flow battery in the world that can integrate renewable energy. Uh, my neighbor's son has is, is got a job there and, and doing great. So this is a job creation engine 
for us, and, and it's working. I, I heard uh, the president say the other day that you can't have wind power because then your television wouldn't work. And um, didn't, didn't he actually say that you'd have to uh, say, figure out if the wind was blowing before you turned the TV on? Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's how I heard it. But. That's what I heard. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> Okay, and moving on, uh, would you concede? Would you concede that a carbon tax or a carbon fee is pretty much a lost cause in the state of Washington after two failures at the ballot? Well, I mean, you, you can't say for the next century. I mean, right now, I, I basically have proposed alternate ways of achieving the, the same end. The bills that we talked about this year, uh, if passed, will achieve roughly the same level of carbon pollution reduction than the carbon tax initiative would have done. And the good things about this effort that we have found is there's multiple tools. Look, if there was only one thing we could do on this and it didn't work, we'd be in deep trouble. But the fact is there's dozens of different policies and investments and incentives and regulatory things we can do that can actually move the clean energy economy forward, and we're doing that in the state of Washington. So uh, I, have, I have learned that uh, there's all kinds of good clean energy, solar, wind, biofuels, you name it, but the two most important sources of energy are uh, optimism and perseverance. And we've got those two things here in the state of Washington. So reports show that Washington State has not been able to, to very much reduce its carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to wonder, is um, a booming economy and a growing population somewhat in conflict with the goal of reducing our carbon footprint here? Uh, not if the legislature passes my bills, we'll be in good shape. <laughs> I mean, it's true. You know, I've been fighting for this for six years now, and we've made some progress legislatively. I have taken some executive action. We have established a Clean Research Institute at the University of Washington. We have uh, developed a 70% uh, of our $70 billion transportation infra infrastructure is public uh, infrastructure, which is low carbon. We've got a clean energy development fund that's working. As we indicated, we're, we're using electric cars more uh, than any other state in the country. So we've done a bunch, but we haven't done enough. And uh, we would have been way ahead had the legislature six years ago done what I had asked them to do. But now they're doing it. They're moving forward. I should give you uh, this caveat, however. We will not be done, even if all these bills pass, to meet our uh, Paris agreement, we will still need to take more action. And uh, we have to figure out what the next steps will be. But I believe this will be solid steps forward. It's consistent with our technology and economic growth that we expect. Now, you mentioned about growth. Yes, we are a magnet for people around the United States. 130,000 people move here every two years because it's an incredible place to live. And they bring cars, and they have more houses, and they got to heat them. So yes, that, when so we have more way. people moving, you need to up your game per capita reducing carbon pollution to meet our statewide goals. Now, I'm fully, I fully believe we can do this because we've already made substantial progress. Uh, so Danny Westney reported that uh, it's been a goal of the state for, I think it's 12 years, uh, to make the state fleet uh, renewable, electric, mm -hmm. but that only 2% so far of the state fleet is that. <clears throat> uh, seems like low-hanging fruit. Why can't, we, why can't we do better on that? Well, I could have been elected 12 years ago. That might have been <laughs> kind, of, kind of helpful, but no, look, you, we, we need, we have adopted some very modest incentives to incentivize people to get electric cars. They've been, they have been successful in that we're leading the nation, but we still need to accelerate that rate of acquisition. And electric cars are uh, extremely uh, fun to drive, safe, speedy. I got a little GM Bolt. I was on The View the other day, and Megan McCain was talking about how this, will, this is just a bunch of nonsense, this will never happen. Well, I got a little blue GM Bolt in my driveway and it's working fine. And it's made by American workers. Now that's a dream that we ought to have. So we just need to get in the business of passing some of these policies and good things are gonna happen. So we learned last week that you are running for president and uh, some Republicans, and I believe one of them is in the House, the State Republican Party Chair, said that it, you should, um, basically stop being governor uh, while you pursue your vanity run, what do you call it? vanity run. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do both jobs at once, the, the job of governor and the job of trying to become president? 
Uh, yes, and I think the proof is in the pudding. We've been very successful during the last several months while I've been exploring this. Uh, we have been able to really uh, provide leadership from the state, and I think the proof is in the pudding with the good legislative uh, progress we're making, with the very uh, bold and robust things that I rolled out uh, shortly before the session, from orcas to mental health uh, to homelessness. We've been very, very active, and, I, and I, yes, we have been found that we can be very effective. And I have to say that the Republicans made the same argument in 2012, too, that I shouldn't be governor. So I'm kind of used to these suggestions. <laughs> Our journalist, uh, Chris Daniels from King 5. Governor, you just mentioned uh, appearance on another television show earlier in the week and your dialogue with Megan McCain about the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that, first of all? And, and the question you didn't answer in, in that television broadcast was how exactly would you pay for it? Well, um, to those who are not familiar with it, there's been kind of a resolution non-binding resolution uh, proposed in, in the House. And my view on this is that this discussion has been helpful to the nation for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, it has got more people talking about climate change. And this is important. In the last three presidential debates, climate change came up about for 14 seconds. You think about this. This is an existential threat to our civilization, literally, we had a general uh, and an admiral today at the University of Washington talking about the national security threat that this poses, and yet it has been largely ignored in our nation's discourse. So I think the discussion of this has been helpful. This has also been helpful in raising the ambition level that we have, because this has to be a, a first priority, in my view, for the United States. And it has also helped bring more people in, uh, in marginalized communities and frontline communities to be engaged in this discussion. But you need to understand this is just an aspirational statement. It was not meant to be a policy statement. And uh, I will be proposing, and I'm not talking about that tonight, <laughs> somebody will be proposing. You're doing well. Very, You're doing well. You got this. Very robust uh, policies meet on the bone of the kind of things that we need to do. And I do think Washington has been a template of progress for the United States. And in this case, a lot of things we're doing here uh, could be national. What I, what I read that you said about the Green New Deal was, again, aspirational. It sounded mm -hmm. a lot like the New York Times editorial that I read on this <laughs> topic. Uh, but do you also think that even that needs more transition time built into it? Well, if you actually read it, there's been a lot of misinformation about the Green New Deal. If you recall the health care debate, when, according to one party, the Democrats were going to make us all subject to death panels, and once you got to my age, you're done. Um, there's a lot of stuff said about things that aren't true, and some of the things that have been said about timelines are simply not true. They're not in the resolution. But yes, we are going to be, uh, have to uh, set, in my mind, robust goals, and I don't think we should get too hung up on the time period. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. When John F. Kennedy, when I remember, he said, we're going to send a man to the moon, bring him back safely within 10 years. We didn't sit around and say, oh, no, no, it's going to be 11 and a half. <laughs> you know, or no, I think we can do it in nine. We just got with it. We got doing the kind of things we need to do. And that's what we need to do in the clean energy. So I don't think it's productive to spend all that much time on the exact parameters. We got to do things this year. Randy Cruz. Yeah, you were quoted as saying in Iowa that you're not going to reject the support of the act now on climate super PAC because you won't condemn any organization that's trying to defeat climate change. You've taken that stance despite critics that say that super PACs allow the wealthy to have an unfair influence uh, in presidential elections. Can, can you sit here and say that you're fully then in support of super PACs or only when the wealthy donors support your vision for the country? My understanding is we're not supposed to talk about How election. About a really religion. short answer. Generally that speaking, can then, go for, Governor. For, generally speaking, as a Democrat. Generally when, speaking. When and are you? When are you in support or not in support of super PACs for presidential campaigns? Well, I will. I'm, I will not speak against people who are fighting against climate change. I don't think uh, that it's helpful to condemn people who are fighting against climate change. I'll leave it at that. Okay, dogs. So. I'm hearing that uh, the, one of the taxes that you mentioned in your budget proposal, the capital 
gains tax increase of, of 9% might not pass this year. And so I'm wondering, what, is, what does that do for some of the spending that you wanted to do on ORCAs and some other projects? If that doesn't pass, does that mean there's not enough for ORCAs? How, how would that work? Well, I proposed uh, fulfilling what I believe are the mandates of the Washington citizens for the services they need. And they're significant. Uh, we have ORCAs that are on the verge of extinction. And to save them, it cannot be done for free or even tiny amounts of money. We have a mental health care system that needs to be reestablished. It was gutted during the recession, and it needs to be rebuilt. We know that we have to do some things for the homeless that continues uh, to plague us. We have an obligation to spend billions of dollars repairing our culverts uh, pursuant to a federal judicial decision. And most importantly, and this is the big I think surprised to a lot of legislators, there's a $4 billion uh, IOU that has to be paid this year for the second half of the McCleary decision. And a lot of people thought we were out of, out of jail on the McCleary decision because we paid for one year of a biennium. Well, now we're in the two-year program, so legislators need to come up with about $4 billion. And you just don't come out of that for air. And unlike the federal government, we have a balanced budget. So there's, there's going to have to be revenues. And the amount of revenues will be required will be dependent on the appetite for spending that leg the legislators eventually decide upon. I've decided on an amount that I think is consistent with the values that we hold dear. I think we should keep work as, as part of our tradition. I think we should reform our mental system. And I think we should fulfill the McCleary decision, which we said we were going to do. And so I propose revenues to be able to do that. So I know there's some, um, at least one member of your ORCA task force here in the audience, Ms. Stephanie Sawin. But so I'm going to go back to something that fisheries uh, experts are already predicting, that this is going to be another very weak year for salmon, which is not good for ailing ORCAs. Are there some immediate steps that, that you know of that we're going to be taking this year? Because this is going to be another really rough year for ORCAs. Well, uh, this is a tough problem because we, for a century and a half, have been building an industrialized society in the very same room that the orcas live in. And we are, I wish I could tell you that I could snap my fingers and solve this problem. What I know is we've got to get going as fast as we can and do the short-term things that we can, one of which is to ease up with the interference in noise that are, the orcas are experiencing. Experiencing, And that's one thing we can do short term. Aren't we doing that this year, uh, limiting the, the, yes. the yes. orca I believe, watching stuff? I believe uh, most of the bill I have proposed will pass. I think we've got a consensus on that to reduce the noise that they are exposed to. Second, we can increase hatchery production to increase production of some of this fish. This is not a, you can't solve this whole problem just by hatchery production. We know that orca are starving to death. And the immediate say, well, why don't we just pump out more fish out of hatcheries? The reason is if you just pump out an infinite amount of fish, first off, it costs a lot of money. And second, if the environment doesn't support the fish once they get in the wild, they die and sink to the bottom and don't you do you any good. So we are in a rational, scientifically sound way increasing hatchery uh, production. We are doing the things that we can do in short term on habitat. And we know habitat is extremely important. So stream habitat, eelgrass bends, and the like, we're trying to make some immediate investments to deal with those things. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, the orca are on the edge. And uh, my hearts are with them. And I hope everybody's going to pull together to do what they can. Uh, I am concerned. I can't tell you that, that right now, I can tell you the legislature is going to do everything that I think we need to do in orcas. I, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Because this is something that's so close to our hearts but it sounds in the like, state of Washington. It sounds like some things we can do have to do with sound, but the, but the, the imminent situation is, is maybe starvation with, with such well, low yes, returns and, of salmon. And we are addressing starvation issues as quickly as we can. Now, we're also looking for, at a very difficult issue for us, and that is predation of competitors for that fish. So orca are now competing for that dwindling source of fish. <laughs> with a hugely spiking population of sea lions. And the sea lions have sort of taken over the environment to some degree. 
And uh, uh, I was supportive of a congressional law that Maria Cantwell got through that will allow the state to become more active in management of the sea lions. And there'll be controversy associated with this. But uh, I see no other option uh, if we're going to keep these uh, orcas around. So audience, if you want to join us, we're going to run out of time really quickly. Please go talk to Addy there for a second and Brandy Cruz. Yeah, let's try this again. Uh, totally off the subject of climate change. Um, it might have the word campaign in it, but it's actually a question about uh, your job as governor. <laughs> so don't, don't get uh, put off by it. Uh, today, a Republican lawmaker who admitted to my fellow reporter that a lot of this is political, but uh, in Olympia, he requested that you pay for the cost of your state patrol security detail while on the campaign trail. Your office has said, basically, that's not something you're going to do. Uh, but it's not just about money. In an email obtained by the Seattle Times, a sergeant for the state patrol said he was concerned about the long-term effects of the health and welfare of the troopers on your detail, given the frequency of your travel across the country. So please answer both parts of this question. Why should Washington taxpayers foot the bill for your security while you're out of the state running for president? And are you, sir, worried about the health and welfare of the troopers protecting you and your family, some of whom I imagine are in this room tonight? Yeah, look, these folks for the state patrol do a super job. They're very dedicated. They're like family to us. So you bet I'm concerned for anything that affects their safety. We've had three troopers who were hit by cars in the snow in the last uh, couple weeks that I've talked to. So this is very personal for Trudy and myself. And that's what, one of the reasons that we have a budget request to make sure that we can have adequate personnel so that they do not get in positions where they're, they're working too long. So I hope the legislature will take care of that. As far as your first question, uh, we're just following the law and we're following what has been the law and the tradition both for Democrat and Republican governors for 100 and plus years now in the state of Washington. We're just going to continue that policy. Hi. Audience question. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks, uh, Gov Governor Inslee. I just wanted to ask about climate change and how you plan as you talk nationally to have a conversation about climate change where it doesn't seem like just a political issue and you convince people on the other side that this is a real issue and not just something we're doing for political points. Well, I'll just, I won't talk about that other issue, uh, but I'll just give you an example of what we've done is I've, I've always sought to get as many voices as possible, Democrats, Republicans, and otherwise in this debate. Now, I'll give you an example. Today, we just had a forum at the University of Washington there's a nonprofit bipartisan or nonpartisan security group, and we had uh, a general and an admiral and a former Republican governor there who were all talking about how climate change is a national security threat. And the admiral talked about how our bases now are getting flooded, and the Navy's having a real problem keeping their ships maintained because of the flooding. The general talked about the fact that when you have desertification and you have starving millions of people, they move and you get mass migration events. We've seen what that looks like just in the last few years of the mass migration in Africa, and that is increasing. He also made reference that that is already happening in Central America. He made reference to Guatemala, where you had this big drought that possibly is one of the reasons we're seeing some migration from that part of the world. So what we are finding is, and I think national security is one place where it might be easier to get bipartisan support, because that's kind of seen as a less partisan issue, not ideological. So I was happy to have a former uh, Republican Governor Whitman uh, today at the UW uh, joining us for this discussion. And I'm looking forward to the emergence of Teddy Roosevelt. It would be a wonderful thing for this country. Uh, but his spirit is alive in the Democratic Party. <laughs> Chris Daniels. I'll uh, ask a question that is not as important as issues like the environment and education, but I know you like a good sports analogy. <laughs> there was a, uh, or is a house bill down in Olympia that would legalize sports betting at tribal casinos. Are you in favor of opening that door in Washington State to allow people to bet on the kids down the street at the University of Washington, Washington State University, the Seahawks, or the Mariners of the Sounders, et cetera? Uh, I actually do not have a position on that, I, I, and uh, I'm going to have to get briefed on that before I can tell you what my position is on that, on that bill. Hmm. I know who to bet on the Apple Cup. I can tell you that. <laughs> I mean, would you, would you, <laughs> would you personally want to bet on the Apple Cup? <laughs> no, because if I followed 
both my heart and my mind, I'd be in a fight with my beautiful cougar spouse. So I'm going <laughs> to avoid that. Audience, hello. Thank Hi. you, Governor. Uh, my name is Niyama Stevens, and I have a health-related question for you. As you know, Washington State is in the middle of a measles, measles epidemic, and a bill was recently passed in the House to remove personal exemptions to vaccination. There's a separate bill being considered in the Senate. I'm curious what the Inslee bill would look like if you were a legislator right now. And since disease knows no borders, what needs to be done at the national level to address situations like we're dealing with here? Well, I'm concerned because we've had decreasing vaccination rates in this country, and as a direct result, we've had increasing epidemics in our children. We experience this here in Washington. So the bills I would propose are the ones that are in the legislature. One has passed the House, and I would propose to, uh, to accept those provisions to narrow the exemptions. I think that's the right thing to do, but that won't be enough. We do need to be able to share scientific information with the public as much as we can. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation. The internet is a wonderful, wonderful tool, but it can give people false information very, very effectively. Uh, and a report came out yesterday that is the, I would consider the absolute definitive report on this that found no causative re relationship between vaccines and autism. It's the you know, hundredth time this has been studied and I consider this definitive. So I do think we need to do more to share that scientific information with parents so that they can make you know, judgments. And if they do, based on science, these children are gonna be vaccinated. I do wanna point this out too, is that when a child is vaccinated, it's not just helping that child, it's helping the other kids in the neighborhood and the school. Because in order to get what's called herd immunity, I hate to think of children as a herd. I don't know, it just doesn't sound right. But to get that immunity, you have to get to a certain level of vaccination, 95, 97, I can't remember the number, or you, or you, you, you can get these epidemics. So this is a decision when you're a parent, you're making for other children, not your own. And that's why I hope we can increase uh, these rates. So we have a Twitter question, and then we're going to have one more audience And question. for people who want to participate, we're taking the questions under the hashtag Civic Cocktail. This is from Twitter user Austin Quinn. He says, college affordability is matter, a matter of vital importance to the over 500,000 students in Washington state. As governor, your proposed budget helps low and middle income families through the state need grant. How can we guarantee funding if there is an economic downturn? Well, by the way, uh, so I have a bill that will have a guarantee that for the state need grant, everybody who's actually eligible for it gets it. So right now we have the best a scholarship program for kids in need in the United States. It is the richest, it is the most comprehensive, it is the most effective, but it's limited by the annual budget appropriation, so not all of the students who are eligible for it are getting it. I would change that by having a proposal that would guarantee these students get it. Then you simply have to, it's like everything else we do in government, you gotta raise the revenues to actually do it. It's the same thing for the McCleary decision. If 100 more children show up in school, we're statutorily obligated uh, and morally obligated to educate them. We propose to have the same thing for the state need grant. And I do want to brag just a minute for our need grant. Uh, the reason it is, it is particularly brilliant is it really focuses first on those who really, really need it and gives them enough to, to actually get through college. That's why we have a higher success rate of these students actually going through college. Other states, frankly, have spread this more like butter, and you have poor kids that might be able to spend, you know, pay for 40% of what it takes, but not 100%. So they go for a year, they go broke, and then they drop out and don't finish. So we have a really good, it's seen as the gold standard by people who study this, but now we need to expand it to make sure everybody gets it. Time Meister say, quick question and quicker answer. Yeah, hi, Governor Inslee, I wanna thank you for being a supporter of the Green New Deal resolution. Um, a big part of that resolution is that we're going to be investing in renewable energy and rapidly transitioning away from fossil fuels. Yet, your recent strategy for the maritime industry, the Maritime Blue 2050 strategy, actually embraces converting ships to LNG, which is fracked gas, um, which is a fossil fuel. 
So do you think this strategy is actually aligned with being a climate champion and being a supporter of the Green New Deal? Well, it is unless there is another technology that convert uh, these ships that use dirty fuel to some other system. And I think if today we had the technology to, win, to run these big ships, for instance, on electric uh, motors with lithium ion batteries or vanadium batteries or hydrogen fuel cells, then no, it would not make sense to do that. Unfortunately, we don't have that uh, existing technology, but we are developing it. So in my budget, uh, I'm proposing to build, uh, convert uh, two uh, ferries to hybrid and two to full electric. And this is going to help drive the electric technology into larger vessels. And when that is proven out, then I think we can move to the next step after ferries, which are these freighters. And I hope we get there. We will be the first state in the United States to, or the first place actually, to have electric ferries. And I'm very excited about that. Again, Washington uh, doing cutting edge work. And we'll have to leave it right there. We have been chatting with Washington Governor Dave Macy. We're going to come back shortly to discuss more politics in the great state of Washington with the two state party chairs. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Have a good day. Good luck. State Democratic Party Chair Tina Podladowski. Greetings to both of you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. We're going to start with you, Caleb. What is it like to be the party chair in a state like Washington that has the longest drought in electing a Republican governor of any state in the whole country? Yeah, when I introduced myself to somebody once and I told them what I did for work, they said, that's a little bit like being the head football coach of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, I'd prefer to say it's a good, I'd yeah. prefer to say it's like being the head coach of the Seattle Mariners. We're going to do better next year. <laughs> All the Mariners fans, they're aching. But yeah, uh, well, yeah, only, only direction is, is, is up right. on that, right? Uh, Tina Podlodowski, would you say you are merely in the right place at the right time, or is there some method to the Democrats' um, madness here in the state of Washington? When, when you and I met, you showed yeah. me this map. You and bet. It, it showed uh, many uh, red and purple legislative districts that were starting to trend blue. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, a, there's certainly a method for us at the Washington State Democrats, and it's all about activating the grassroots. Look, for us to be able to win these sorts of elections in Washington State means churning out our voters, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. We you call look, them our voters. Or, well, they are all, all of voters. our voters. All of them are our okay. voters, right? Um, and whether they identify as independents. But the question is, what do we need to do to churn out people to vote? We have 4.3 million people who are registered to vote in the state of Washington. We have close to 7 million that could be eligible. We have people who turn out maybe at a 70% rate, maybe 75%. So a lot of work to do. For us at the State Party as Democrats, it's all about the grassroots. It's all about inclusivity. It's all about making sure that voters understand what democratic values we represent and getting them to vote that way at the ballot box. But in addition to that, what, what is the, how many of these districts are now? They were long time purple, long time red. Sure. How many of them are, do you see in your uh, projections there. Well, def uh, definitely more. I mean, if you look at Washington State, when I started as state party chair in 2017, we had a one-seat minority in the state Senate and a two-seat majority in the state House. Now in this session, we have a seven-seat majority in the state Senate and a 16-seat majority in the state House. And the vast... Thanks, Democrats. And the vast majority of the people that we elected, though, are, are people who represent their district and that new American electorate. So it's women, it's people of color, it's LGBTQ folks, it's folks who are middle class, it's folks who are uh, recent immigrants and refugees. I mean, we span the gamut in terms of putting out candidates who represent the electorate that they are representing in their, in their jobs. So, Caleb, are there any um, longtime blue districts that are now trending? Yeah, and red? I, yep, I always absolutely. look at Pierce County as one that's Certainly, Pierce County is definitely flipped. We have a Republican county executive. If you look at Grays Harbor County, 
Uh, we won the 19th district in 2016. That was the first time that seat had gone Republican in over 30 years. If you look at the results of what happened in 2018 in the primary, we were poised to lose 17 or 18 seats. We uh, worked really hard from August to November, connected with the grassroots, educated people, talked about preserving balance in Olympia, and we saved eight of those seats. Now, Republicans did lose 10 seats in 2018. That was right on par with what Democrats lost in 2010, so it was a very typical year when you have a pendulum swinging against the party that controls the White House. So I would say it was within the realm of the norm. But we saved eight seats, which was really a historic turnaround. 95% of the time, if you lose the primary, you lose in November. And so for us to save those eight seats by the work that we did at the state Republican Party helps preserve balance. It helps make sure that taxpayers are represented down in Olympia. Caleb, do you think um, Governor Inslee, who I think has left the room, has time to run for president and be governor? Can he really do both those? I, I do not. And tests? here's why. In 2012, when he was running for governor, he brought this up the last half hour, he stepped down as a member of Congress. He resigned his congressional seat to run for governor in 2012. He set the precedent for himself. In no other job could you tell your boss, I'm going to spend the next six months traveling the country, spending a lot of time in Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada, and I'm looking for another job, but I, uh, I want you to keep paying me $175,000 a year and uh, paying for my security. And that's what he's telling the taxpayers of this state. I think he's not focused. He's focused on his personal political ambitions and not the people of Washington state and our well, wants and desires. Wait a I got, I got oh. five names for you, though. John Kasich, Chris Christie, Scott Walker, Bobby Jindal, and let me add George W. Bush to that. All of those Republican governors, none of them stepped down well, when they were running for president. That's what arguably, I was ask you. arguably, Did you say that then? Yeah, Did yeah. you I mean, say that then about Bobby when George Jindal w. Bush, and Scott Walker When George W. Bush was running for president, I was 14 years old, so, so I don't think I made it? a statement did in the eighth grade about that. <laughs> you would have to go back and check. Um, but look, it, it, I think that the point still stands, and I've talked to a lot of people that are concerned and frustrated about what's going on in this Washington. We've got the Department of Corrections that has a glitch and has early released over 3,000 prisoners. We've got Western State Hospital that the Seattle Times editorialized. The blame for that falls squarely on Governor Inslee and his mismanagement. We've got real issues in this state that while Governor Inslee has been traveling the country, prioritizing the DGA and his personal run, the people of this state are being neglected. And I think that message is resonating. Tina, are people being a I think neglected. the people of our country are being neglected by this Republican president and a Congress that refuses to get anything done. I think what we've got here in Washington state is the best economy in the country. I think what we've got in Washington state are dedicated public servants who work for a terrific Democratic governor who are looking for great solutions every day. Do we have big problems? Of course we do. Are some of those problems funding for these issues? Of course they are. Maybe if the Republicans at the federal level hadn't packed these, passed these absurd tax cuts, we wouldn't be even having these discussions. But the reality is, I think that we can um, continue to do the work in a way that makes sense. We have great people, for example, Lisa Brown coming on to the Commerce Department, as well as others, great public servants that are there doing this work. And there's this great thing, it's called um, the internet. I, it doesn't matter where I am in the state of Washington, I can do my work that way via the internet. And this other great thing called a cell phone, the governor can continue to do his work too. So what about that? Do you, do you think do you think the governor can? You know, I mean, department heads mostly do some of the tasks that you're. I think about, as Governor Inslee said, but they do it at the direction of a governor. I think as who Governor Inslee said, saying, has a cell phone the proof is in the computer. pudding. We've had mismanagement at the Department of Corrections at Western State Hospital. The governor himself didn't have a specific answer on a question about a bill before the legislature, probably because he was in Iowa yesterday. There's no question that he's distracted and not focused on this job. And look, yes, of course you can check email and be on your cell phone, but it's kind of hard to do that when you're campaigning all day, spending time on national TV and in other in interviews and audience. Is, his focus is elsewhere, and I think the people deserve a governor that's focused on this state. Brandy. Yeah, perhaps it's a good segue talking about the future of our state. Tina, I'll start with you because I think it's the best question for you, but Caleb, um, I'm interested to see what you have to say. Governor Inslee made it clear on Friday that he has not ruled out seeking a third term for governor. While he says that, he has political allies behind the scenes who are contemplating a run, and they need to make that decision sooner rather than later, especially if they don't want a Republican contender to get out in front of them and start campaigning and leave them behind. So, Tina, for you, um, for people like Bob Ferguson, Dow Constantine, Hillary Franz, out of respect for them and the party's ability to win the governor's office again, 
When does Jay Inslee need to make the decision about which path he's going to take? Well, I don't doubt that the Democrats will continue to take the governor's office no matter who the candidate is. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you asked, you know, a Republican getting out in front of folks. I, I don't see that happening. So I think that there's plenty of time. You know, there's plenty of time. Out of respect for those other people. Out of respect for the people who right. are his political allies and friends who right. are trying to decide if they want to make this huge life decision about right. who I run for governor. And it takes time to make those decisions and look at all of these different issues. Look, Paul, right now, I think we have a moment here in both our state and our country. We deserve to have the best person in the Oval Office. We do not have that now uh, in any way, shape, or form. So we have an opportunity to listen, not just to candidates like Governor Inslee, but the whole set of terrific Democratic candidates and get issues out there. Tell, I've tell got two kids. Tell us about yeah. the Democratic bench. Yeah. You know, well, the Democratic uh, bench who's is... Who's rising? Who's, who's up Democratic for these jobs? The Democratic bench is deep in Washington State, and it's getting deeper. Look, we've elected terrific people. You've named three of them right there. But there's even more great folks in the state legislature doing that work, and we elected a whole new set of them. No, Native who, is running, yeah. who is running for yeah. governor, if, 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 and who is running for attorney general, you if, know, if, if? I think there's a lot of if, if, if there, not a lot of I've decided, I've decided. Decided, I've decided um, on any of those places. If anything, the Democrats probably have the opposite problem of the Republicans, which is we have so many great elected officials. All of them can fulfill these different sorts of roles all the way up and down the ticket. And we're building the bench even bigger because in 2019, we're playing in over 3,000 different local races up and down the ticket in Washington state, everything from PUD commissioner and school board member to city council members and county council members. Uh, remember, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a first-generation kid. My mom and dad were Polish immigrants. I grew up between the Union Hall and the Polish American Club. I learned politics there, but I learned how to run a business at a place called Microsoft across the lake. That's where, and we think in many, many years and many, many ways of making this accessible to everyone in the state of Washington. So, Caleb, the Republican bench. So who is who is going to run for governor? In I think Brandy had a story about three or four potential candidates, including J.T. Wilcox, Doug Erickson, maybe Bill Bryan again. We have Congresswoman Jamie Herrera-Butler, um, who I think is a rising star in the party. So I think there's no shortage. I mentioned Bruce Stanmeyer earlier, uh, well, the county executive in Pierce so County. So that's all for governor. What about Potential. for attorney general? Uh, I think there's a, quite a few Republican lawyers. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think Give we are going to... Uh, Paul Graves. Uh, you could look at uh, a couple others, but I think there's uh, we have strong Republicans across the different counties. We have many local elected in the county councils, county executive seats. We still have a lot of good, solid Republican legislators. Does, and so does I Rob think Rob McKenna ever come back and run for governor? Again? You'd have to ask Rob. I don't think I he's uh, is interested at this point. I never point stop in time. asking Rob. <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> I think, look, I think the people of Washington State are looking for solutions. They're looking for leadership. And I think you uh, you disrespect the voters with a, it's, it's always a risk. You can't take anything for granted. And I think uh, that we're working hard to connect with voters across the state to make sure their voices are heard in Olympia. Chris Daniels. Well, one of the things that people complain about in, in politics is decorum right now and civility, whether it be a tweet from the president or the circus at a Seattle City Council meeting. How is a party chair, do you restore decorum in politics in Washington State? I think one of the biggest things is how we conduct ourselves personally and individually, and that's certainly something we've striven to do at our staff, is the way we conduct ourselves, the way we run campaign ads, the way we communicate. We can agree to disagree, but have a level of mutual respect to actually have a dialogue. There was an interesting article in The Atlantic about ranking King County as the least politically, or one of the least politically tolerant counties in the entire United States. And so I think that's a challenge to all of us, to have a dialogue with people we disagree with. Um, and so I'm happy. I'll be your Republican friend if you need one. Uh, <laughs> but we can, we can get coffee and we can talk. And yeah, I think it's important. People have parties and they need to invite There one. you go. Right. I'll come to your house party. Uh, but it's important that we have a dialogue and we can agree to disagree, but still treat each other with respect and dignity. And I think that's very important. Mm, absolutely. I'd like to move along to the um, mm -hmm. presidential primary, which is apparently moving up several months. Mm -hmm. And Tina, um, yeah. would the Democrats, um, and maybe this is a decision that hasn't been made yet, 
But would the Democrats finally accept the results of a presidential primary? Right. So the bill, um, so it's a little bit complicated because the rules of presidential primaries are set by the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. For many, many years, we did not have a presidential primary here in Washington state that conformed to those rules. Now a bill went through the legislature. It's awaiting signature uh, by the governor that would um, conform the primary to those rules and allow Democrats for the first time to be able to use a primary and have that count towards selecting uh, the apportionment of delegates for different presidential candidates. The decision will be made by our state committee. That's over 176 people that represent our counties and our legislative districts. It'll happen on April 7th in Pasco. Um, I'm sure it'll be a great what discussion, you but um, you know what? I'm state party chair and I'm staying neutral because oh. um, this is the state party's decision. It makes a big difference, but you can go to um, our website and you can actually vote on it as well. There's a box you can click. You can see both plans that we have out there, one to utilize caucuses, one to utilize primaries. We'd love to have people click on that and give us comments and let us know what they think. Kelly, why has the Republican Party, um, all, you know, for a long time been willing to accept the state primary? Yeah, in 2016, we used the primary to allocate 100% of our delegates. I think there's a couple shortcomings of a caucus. Um, it's less accessible to people that may work on a Saturday, so you have hardworking families that can't come and can't have their voice heard. When you have people in the military that are maybe deployed or stationed overseas, they can't be present to participate in the caucus, so if there's a primary, they're able to get their ballot and still vote. Um, and so we want as many people participating as possible in our process, and that's why we used the primary in the past, and I'm confident we're going to use the primary in 2020 to allow uh, more people in Washington State to have their voice heard. So uh, former Secretary of State Ralph Monroe um, was quoted today as saying that a lot of people might, you know, it sounds like great news. Oh, finally, Washington's part of the, the real presidential primaries. We, we don't have our primary at the end of May when all the decisions have been made. But for voters here who love to be independent, there's a, there's a, a drawback to it. And this, again, is probably state party rules, but that you actually have to affiliate. And, you, and, and the lists that are created from those votes uh, are then given to the parties. And people around here are not hello, accustomed to that. Right. So what about that? So um, uh, Ralph's kind of incorrect in how he characterized that and, and how that ends up working. What you need to do is, for the sake of voting whatever side of the ballot that you want to vote on, the Democratic side or the Republican side, you need to affiliate and check for that moment that you're deciding you are going to identify with the Democratic Party to do that, which makes so perfect sense. Democrat I, for, for a year, you not could, forever, right? Is you could be saying? a Democrat for the 90 seconds that it takes you to, you know, decide and, and hit that side of the ballot to make that happen. We need to be able to have that data available because we have recount provisions. Remember how these primaries work, right? You have to get at least 15% of the vote in each congressional district in a state in a primary to get delegates. On the Democratic side of the ballot, if you've got 10 people running, 15 people running, it, a lot of people could be sitting at that 14.5% threshold, 14.8% threshold. I need to be able to go back and count each and every one of those votes because you can be sure the candidates are going to ask me for those recounts because it matters in that delegate count. It'll be that fierce in this cycle. Caleb, what about those voters who mm -hmm. don't really want phone calls from you folks? <laughs> but I mean, because they're as, on a list. Because I agree with Tina. As Tina said, look, you're you're choosing at that moment to participate in a presidential nominating process. You're saying I am a member of you're this party in. at this moment. Yeah. And as yeah. Tina said, it's not binding for life. It doesn't change your party registration. We still don't register by party in this state. And so I think it's an important part of participating in the process of nominating who the two major parties have as their nominee. And if you're registered to vote, it's public information. You're on yeah. that list already. There's a question, question here, hashtag civic cocktail coming in on Twitter from Kiana Scott for both of you. Mm -hmm. The 2018 midterm site, tremendous increase of diverse candidates up and down the ballot, but mostly on the Dem side. To Tina and Caleb, how are you planning to address your party's shortcomings? You want to go first? I don't, go? I, we, we are not the side with the shortcomings. We're the <laughs> side that, 
we're the side that make progress. I have to say, look, you look at the state legislature now, it is the most diverse state legislature ever in the history of the state legislature. We're back up to 42% women in the state legislature. That's because of what the Democrats did. But more so than that- Wait, Do you what, know how that stacks nationally? I used to track yes, that number Yes, we are the-, um, the uh, Maine it's was no, always ahead or behind. Or we something. are number three, I think, at this point. Nevada now has exceeded the 50%. Yeah, um, there's one other state that's sitting there really closely, and I can't remember it at this moment in time. What's that? Oregon, Oregon thank you. Um, so, uh, so, and I hate being behind Oregon in anything. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's my friends in Oregon. Or right. That. But that's why we've started this program, Rise and Run. We are out recruiting candidates and working with not just all the diverse um, organizations that are out there working with other populations, but changing our staff. Our staff is diverse. Uh, the places where we're at, the places where we have offices are very different and diverse. And we are encouraging and training people how to run for office. You have to have a plan and you have to work that plan every day. And looking at our state legislature right now, I think we've made a great stride. Is it where it should be? No, because there, there, you need to see even more diversity in the folks that are there. But that might be my friend's job. Yeah, more and than I my would job. just say that we are very <laughs> busy working across the state, organizing to recruit yeah. good people to run of all, uh, of all races, sexual preferences. Uh, lots more women. Uh, we certainly want to have a. A, a candidates that represent their communities and bring voice to their communities and represent their values in Olympia. So that's certainly something we're passionate about on the Republican side and the work that we're doing in trying to recruit candidates for Congress, for state legislature, as well as for local city council school boards right now. Um, so we're very engaged in that. So audience, if you want to join us, we're going to run out of time. You should go talk to Addie there. I have a question for you, yeah. Tina. A lot of your uh, felling a lot here, uh, bragging a lot about the Democrats. But the Democrats uh, says the, you. It's just I know the it goes truth, with the job, Joni. but, okay. but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but yeah. the Democrats yeah. run the risk of yeah. um, letting their sort of harsh partisan mm -hmm. left um, kind of ruin their chances for um, for 2020. So how? What is the conversation within you know the the state party chairs about how not to? to have the, the far left take over the party. Well, I think the Democratic Party has also has always been a big tent. And I think to take that away from the Democratic Party and that diversity of thought would be taking away our strength, which is indeed our diversity around those issues. I think where we need to be united is how we uh, ultimately implement our values in making that happen. So I don't think it's bad to have the discussions. I don't think that there are uh, different factions taking over the party. I think we're having some really great discussions on how do we implement those values and how do we get there faster um, in, in some cases. So a, a lot of it has to do with how we govern as well. Kelly, what is your elevator speech on Donald Trump in this state? Do you, when people, no seriously, when people say to you, um, wow, you know, Donald Trump, you know, he's, he's harsh rhetoric, you know, name calling. So how do you, to build what you're trying to build in this state, sort of explain you to them? Yeah, my, my position is I'm happy to defend the policies. I'm happy to debate about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I'm happy to talk about how that's put more money in my family's pocket and the pockets of families across the United States. I'm happy to talk about 3% GDP growth. 4 million new jobs in the last two years, trade agreements with China, Mexico, and Canada. But it's not my job as the state party chair to defend everything the President Trumps, everything he every, tweets, <laughs> everything that President Trump tweets, sorry, uh, or everything he says, um, because I'm not his spokesman. I'm focused on this Washington and Washington State and working hard for my family and the families in this community to make sure they have a voice down in Olympia, and that's what we're focused on at the state Republican Party. Brandy. Yeah. When a room claps for Caleb at this setting, I've got to let him have that. Um, on this subject, we are about to be in the heat of campaign season, presidential election, election for the governor's office. Can you both, on the subject of what Chris Daniels had talked about earlier, about civility, can you both in this room full of people, to our television audience, can you pledge that you will speak up when one of your candidates engages in personal attacks, when one of your candidates engages in behavior or language that lowers the bar? Can you both pledge to everyone in this room and everyone watching that you will speak up and say something? Absolutely, and I think we've already done that. Mm -hmm. um, when, so, when did you do that? Well, I think, um, uh, I think it's really important as you sort to start to take a look at what happened in the last cycle in 2018 and various things that happened between the two parties. I think both of us uh, did that. 
Um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about a couple of different examples, but I, I don't necessarily, it's a long story is where I'm getting to <laughs> on those things, but I think we did that, yeah. Thank well, you. and certainly yeah. we had this yeah. conversation. I'm happy yeah. to make that pledge. Yeah. We had the conversation with Brandy on bridging yeah. the divide, and I called yeah. uh, somebody that I felt a Republican right. hit mailer was inappropriate. Right. I called Tara mm -hmm. Simmons, left her a voicemail, and mm -hmm. said, that was out of bounds. I appreciate your story, and I think you're a hero. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's important. I mean, I'm a person. Uh, I've got two young kids that are watching what I'm doing, and I want to leave a good example for them of how uh, people should behave in, in public life. The president right now is looking like he's done a lot of really illegal things. It's looking that way, allegedly. I'm not there. But at what point can the Republicans say, you know what? We can find a person who isn't paying off people, who isn't hiding their money in foreign countries, who isn't trying to do all this, who will carry what we believe in forward. When do we, when do we give up on defending anybody, no matter how terrible what we find out about them is? Because it really, we're setting an example for all the people to see. Are we going to be a society that accepts any kind of behavior okay. as long as they're on the right side? Or are we actually going to say we can be better than this? I think what we've seen from members of Congress from what Jamie Herr Butler said is let's, let's let the investigations play out. And when there's facts, when there's there, there, then I think there's going to be, there's people willing to have that discussion. But I think at this point on some of those things, there's allegations. I think Michael Cohen is a very flawed character witness. Um, so as they investigate and get facts, I think it's important to have these discussions based on facts. So, going back to the primary for a second, um, Caleb, would it be good for uh, Republicans in Washington state if there were a primary challenge to the president? Is that something you'd love to see? I've said before that it's a, we have an open process. If anybody decides to run, they'll be on the ballot. They'll, people will be voting. Uh, we'll see. I think President Trump's record on the economy has caused a lot of people to uh, continue to support him. So you see uh, about 90 percent approval amongst Republicans in most areas. So it would be tough uh, to unseat a sitting president. But uh, there's a lot of time between now and the election. I think Twitter is, uh, has something to you say. You want to do it? Or you... Sure. We can, we can read it at the same time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, at Sarah Stood has a question for both of you. She says, how is your party responding to sexual assault allegations against members of your party and candidates moving forward? Make it very clear for her. Right. Well, and uh, that's what I was going to get to, frankly, in terms of the discussion that we just had, which is um, I keep thinking of Trump, and I, I don't really care about the Michael Cohen pieces. I do, but I go back to all the women who have been sexually harassed by this particular president. The fact that he's president is an abomination on that alone. Um, I look at what we've been able to do in our party and how we've dealt with that. The David Sawyers in our party, the Kevin Rankers in our party, the process took time, but we got rid of those folks in terms of the process. Um, I think that as long as I'm state party chair, we will continue to do that and we will continue to do that even if, um, it, even if it's controversial in making that happen. I would challenge the Republican Party to do the same. I, I think we need to make that happen. And in fact, on what specific? I would, Mike, I, I'm, I'm going to say, look, Matt Manweller, right? Well, in the 13th argue, Matt district. Matt Manweller resigned. Matt Senator Manweller Joe only Fain. resigned after the election. After there was an investigation. After, the, it, there after, was an investigation after nine years of investigation. How long does it take? How long does it well, take? I would argue, same thing with Joe Fain. Same thing with Jesse Young. Same thing with all of these guys. No, no, as a no, woman, Joe and Fain, a, there was never an investigation. As a Here's woman the, and the, a state party chair, I am tired of it. And I would say every woman <laughs> in America is tired of it. We had the same interview with Brandy Cruz, and I said, first yeah. of all, women need to be believed, and not just women, any victim needs to be believed, but there needs to be a process. There needs to be due process so that somebody can uh, be accused and respond to the accusations. And so far, what we've seen from the Democratic Party is the instance there's an allegation, take Joe Fain, the Democrats call on him to resign. But when there's an allegation against Kevin Ranker, they give him three or four months for an investigation, and then he resigns. So these are two serious issues to be playing politics, and I think we should have the same standard, which the Republican Party has had a consistent standard, hear out the allegations, have an investigation, and then deal with it at the end. And I thank you both. Yeah. Uh, I, have to, I have to wrap it up here. We have been talking with Caleb Heimlich, chair of the Washington State GOP, and Tina Podlodowski, chair of the State Democrats. We'll be back next month with Seattle and King County police leaders Carmen Best and Mitzi Johanknik. Thanks a ton for watching.